Go. All right. Well, here we go. We finished up the general two weeks ago. Might as well get going with extra, right? Who are you? I don't know who I are. <laughs> All right. I'm Jeff, okay? N0JFY. And this is my better half, more knowledgeable half, and uh, KF0, KFA, and I have to read that. So. Kentucky Fried Zero, Kentucky Fried Out. In non phonetic language. But anyway, welcome. Welcome to the extra class. We're going to run this for. Uh, 12 weeks is the plan for the testing session at the end. And so as we go through the class, if anybody has any questions, make sure you bring them up. And uh, we, if I don't have the answer, uh, we'll find somebody that does. And I don't know, we're all my, uh, well, Tom's my extra here, and uh, Howard's my extra here. And so we, we, we'll get through them, right? Yeah, these guys are brand new, so they uh, they know the stuff. It's all in the book. It's all in the book. <laughs> so anyway, I went to uh, the ARRL site to pull down their slides, which they had a very good slide deck prepared for the general class. Okay. And as I pull up the uh, ARRL slides for extra, guess what comes up? General class. Nothing. Really? Nothing. They don't have any extra slides. So, not to be outdone by ARRL, we're not going to let them slow us down. We're not going to let them stop us. So, I went out to the trusty, rusty internet, and I found a fellow out of Utah. No G. Ratzlaff. And he had a very nice slide deck out there for the extra class. And he is an extra teacher out in Utah and has been teaching it for a long period of time. And so uh, I contacted Noji and I says, uh, hey, I like your slides. What's the possibility of us using them? And he said, absolutely. And uh, so I'd like to give special thanks to, to Noji. He's authorized us to use his uh, slide deck and modify it however we want. And uh, gave us the passwords. It's password protected. He gave us the password so that we could do that. So, very super nice. Su he's a super nice uh, individual, and uh, I've got family out that way. He says, next time you get out here, uh, you know, come on over to my place and uh, we'll have some lunch. So, uh, I got a friend out there, and you know, the ham radio community, you make friends wherever you go. So, but we'd like to thank him uh, for that. Uh, you know, he's got degrees in electrical engineering and math, and uh, he's... Uh, so, yeah, the slides look... <laughs> so he's, he's got some, he's got some yeah. of his uh, <laughs> mathematical slides that we're going to kind of... They're there. <laughs> and they're correct. And we'll probably get into them a little bit, but not as deep as, as he does because I'm a bean counter, okay? <laughs> I, am, I am not an electrical engineer. Uh, I want the fun part. And, <laughs> well, they need to explain And Brian can explain those to us as, as we get to them. All right. So, you know, just a little bit about myself and, and Penny. Um, you know, we're both amateur extras, we're both VEs. I've got my MBA, I got it from Western Governors University a uh, long time ago. And even farther back, I got a, a BS, yes, a BS in accounting from the University of Maryland. And Penny, she's above me, she got a BA in computer science from Utah State University. We have eight children and we have seven grandchildren present time. None on the way. All right, so the purpose of this course, and I'm probably sitting right in your way, aren't I? Okay, we want to prepare you for the extra exam. Um, that's really the, the purpose of the course, is to get you prepared for that extra exam. 
It, uh, it goes from 35 questions on the general and the tech to 50 questions. The testing pool is, is larger. But once you get the extra, you're set, right? You got full band privileges, and it's, it's all good. So we're going to cover some of the difficult to understand concepts and uh, hopefully make them easier to understand. That will be our goal. And provide you with another sleep aid. Okay? Now, if I totally bore you in here and you fall asleep, just don't snore. Okay, that's all I ask. Just don't snore. But I hopefully will keep you alive. Uh, keep, what we want to keep you alive or Mike's going to have business. Not that we want to take business away from you. But we want to wait, wait on that. Okay, so basic course outline. Section one, we're going to cover the rules, the standards, and procedures. You know, standards, privileges, problems, satellites. Section two, we're going to talk about the amateur practices and the electrical principles which is analog, digital, components, characteristics, some of those things we'll be covering. Section three is advanced components and practical cir circuits. So this is similar to some of the stuff we have covered before, except it goes in more in depth when it comes to the components and the, and the circuits. So we'll talk about semiconductors, logic circuits, amplifiers, filters, Section four, we'll talk about antennas and transmission lines. So what are the radiation powers? What's gain all about? Beam width, what, what's SWR, standing wave ratio? So some of this stuff probably sounds familiar from tech class and general class, some of these terms that we're talking about. Um, and they are, because we cover some of them in more in depth in, the, in this course. So section five, Signals, emissions, propagation. So what are signal and emission types? What are safety practices? So those are really the five sections that we will uh, we'll cover. The ARRL book is broken down into 11 chapters, I believe, for the extra. I think, can you verify that? Yes. So there's 11, 11 different chapters. The other ones, the tech class had nine, eight or nine chapters. So it's a little bit more. So, so what do we plan on accomplishing today? We want to introduce the course materials, of course. So we'll cover the foundation for discussion. You know, make sure we're all talking the same language. We're going to get into the FCC rules and standards. We're going to get into E1. Now, this is where we're going to be just a little bit different than in the general class. In the general class, we pretty much followed the book, chapter by chapter. Now, if you take a look in the ARRL book, it's broken down into sections. There's your section one, which covers FCC rules and standards. Well, this kind of equates to chapter two. In the, in the advanced book. And some of the questions even follow into different chapters. So we're going to cover, you know, a little bit different. We'll have to cover the sections based on how they set them up for the testing. Okay? And mainly because these slides kind of go in that direction without redoing them all. Uh, excuse me. So it's kind of set up, but kind of so you got order, right? Yes. It, yeah. It, it sets it up very close to what's ham studied on the org it is with the uh, with the different elements, and uh, we'll see that here in a, in a slide or two. Okay. So we're going to talk about FCC rules and standards. We're going to talk about operating procedures tonight. And so, try stay awake. I know it's been a long day. It's towards the end of the day, but try. Okay, now study the ARRL Extra Class License Manual. So, this is a very good manual. We'll 
looks like this. And uh, Tom brought one in that he has donated to the club. So if anybody wants to check that out, um, we can definitely check it out to you. And uh, I'd recommend getting one if you can. Um, the best place, I you can get it from ARRL, or you can get it from Amazon. Amazon's usually a little bit cheaper. Same price. Same price now? There's some used ones. Okay. I haven't, I haven't looked for a while. Last time I looked, it, it was a little bit cheaper. A couple there was a used one that's like $3 cheaper than they charge us $3.95 for postage. Oh. <laughs> I think I paid a little bit less on Amazon. They, they go on sale. It, it, it depends, yeah. Um, depends on the day, yeah, right? 30 bucks yeah. So that's about 30 bucks worth. 30 bucks, yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. So it's the 12th edition. And I'm going to encourage you that if you don't have an account with the hempstudy.org, that you set one up. Uh, you'll find that that is a great place to, uh, to study and uh, for, it, it depends on your study style, okay? Some people it works well with, some people it works better to, to go through the book. So it, you know how, how best you study and how best you learn. So, but HaveStudy.org is a, is a good place to, uh, to go. It's a free account. And then, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, Penny has all the answers. Um, and she can be reached uh, at pennyjdickerson at yahoo.com. If she can't answer it, you can get with me and I can get to Randy and he'll, he'll find the answer. Um, but anyway, there's our phone numbers, but don't hesitate to call us. Those are both of our cell phones. So if you have questions, feel free to to so I would uh, for 2 a.m. and I'm pondering something, give you a shout. As long as, you, leave a, as long as you can text me at 2 a.m., no problem. I will not be answering the phone at 2 a.m. unless it's one of my children. If it's one of my children, I will answer. Oh, an email. And an email works, but don't, don't hesitate, Brian. <laughs> Even if you think of a question in the middle of the night, yeah, send us an email. Because if I have a question in the middle of the night by morning, I've forgotten what that question is. But yeah, don't hesitate to contact us. And also, every Saturday morning, let me put a plug in here, the Elmernet, 147.105, tone 85.4. Join us on the Elmernet. If you have a question about the extra class, any question at all, bring it to the Elmer class, the Elmernet. And uh, we can kick it around and get an answer. Right, Randy? Unless I'm not available then. Okay, so why? Why should I get an ex my extra license, right? I, I got my tech. That gave me basically privileges on uh, VHF, UHF, and a little bit of tech meter, right? I went and I got my general. Wow, I'm on HF now. I've got more band privileges. I can play on basically, you know, pretty much everything I can play on. So why in the world would I want to get my extra? It's there. Because it's there. <laughs> why would anybody want to climb Mount Everest, right? Because it's there. I haven't even gotten that far yet. Okay, so you can transmit, you get transmit privileges on all the amateur frequencies. So it opens up all the bands. You don't have to worry about, uh, okay, so I'm in general, and I'm on 20 meters. Ooh, I, I, I am limited to 14.225 to 14.350 instead of, uh, you know, 14.150 to 14.350. So it opens up your band, bands, and uh, as long as you know what your band plan is, you know you can operate anywhere in So that's one reason. What's another one? You can get a better call sign if you want one, right? And a shorter call sign. 
So there's more call signs opened up to amateur extras and others. I know some folks have K-C-A-C-I-A. It's something. What, what's your call sign? N-Zero-T-A-C. N-Zero-T-A-C. <coughs> it's a vanity call. A vanity call. It's actually my third call. Your third one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the original is K-E-Zero-I-D-E. -E okay. Which so, just not a lot of time. Right, ex exactly. So if you got a call sign, you know, that you know, it just doesn't quite roll, and you want to get a vanity, you get your extra, you can get the shorter ones that are available out there. You get you get first pick of those. Okay. You can ex assist in administering exams as a VE. Okay. You can help out with contesting on, on otherwise unavailable frequencies. So if you got frequencies that you're not available to you as a tech or a general, as an extra, you can you can operate on those. Prestige, you know, I'm an extra. Yeah. Some people it means a lot. Bragging rights. Bragging rights, yes. They said it up 16 percent Okay. Okay, so it's it's a uh, pretty good thing, right? 16 percent. You can be part of that too. Okay, tired of getting babysat on field day or poda. Okay, so what do you think that means? I'm a general. I come to the clubhouse on field day, and they say, "Okay, we can. You can operate anywhere because there's extras in the room, right?" Well, you can go out to a park, and I can. You can if you're out with the club. You can operate anywhere because there's extras out there, right? They could be the control operator on any part of that frequency. So we don't worry about the frequency that we're operating on. But if you go out to the park all by yourself, you gotta make sure you're staying within your damn privileges. Okay? If you're an extra, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Right? Okay. And possibly you can have more credibility for teaching ham radio courses. And maybe not. Okay. Um, I don't know that being an extra gives me any more credibility than any of the rest of you. Probably not. Because you can all have that in the same knowledge. In fact, you probably all know more than I do. So. But these are some of the reasons. And the sheer challenge. Because you can. Right? Because it's there. Because you can. Alright. So, register with hamstudy.org. Um, it's a free account. Um, it's a good place to go. You can access it via your email. You can, uh, there's recommended study methods. There's multiple study methods with hamstudy.org that, that you can use. Pretty uh, good. You've got flashcards. You spend five minutes on E1 a day. It's going to come to you. Okay. But you want to be consistent going through it and, and practicing with it. And this is what it looks like. Okay. For anybody that hasn't gone out there to look at it, this is what it looks like. Uh, so you can study with flashcards, you can read the questions, you can take practice tests. And as you go through these elements, it goes E1 through E10, right? And uh, it tells you what your proficiency is as you're, uh, you're going through them. It tells you if you've seen all the questions. Gives you your aptitude. It tells you, you know, if you've seen them all, and uh, so it gives you some good, good things, and kind of you can judge where you're at. You know, a rule of thumb: if you're, if you're getting up here at hamstudy.org, and you're getting a, taking a practice test, and you're getting up in the 80 percentile, you're probably in pretty good shape to take the test. Okay. Study mode. All right, this is the difference. Probably the probably the same thing. My, I mean this this was back. They they probably updated. They're constantly updating. This is the 2016 slide. So. So they're using the actual questions. 
they do use the actual questions, yes. And so what they will do is whenever there is an upgrade to the, uh, to the testing pool, they update the questions so that they're using the actual questions in there. And that's what makes it nice is because you're seeing those actual questions. And uh, you, can make, you can go through it and you can read the questions. You can read the questions with the answers and only the answers, or you can read them with a multiple choice. So it gives you an op opportunity to, to look at the different questions. And the multiple choice does have the actual multiple choice answers that they give you on the test. So. Spent a lot of time on that. When I did the, I did the uh, technician before I realized how to use the whole site. So if you just click on like study mode or read questions, it just goes through all of them randomly. So you have to click down and you can do just an E1 or an E2 or E3, but you have to set it up that way. Yes. Yes, as you go in, you would set up whether you're you know, wanting to see the questions for E1. And you can study strictly E1, right? It's right. a lot easier. And it's easier to do it that way, study yeah. one section at a time. Uh, when you get towards the end, the, the easiest thing that I found is taking the practice test. And that, that gives you something from everything. But before you start doing that, I would suggest that you get most of these, you know, proficiency up in, up in this neck of the woods. Any questions? All right. Okay. And it, oh, just as Howard was saying, be sure to study one sub-element at a time. And this uh, is a good way to do it. That way you can focus on what that sub-element is and not get confused by, by throwing that other information in. And you can get one of them down solid, and then you can go on to the, to the others. Okay. Well, we want to make sure we're speaking the same language. Right, Ricky? Yes. One time. We want to speak the same language. No one speaks my language. <laughs> we're still trying to figure your language out. But we do. Same language. Okay. Okay, we talked about phone. What's a phone? What is phone? Two-way communication. The way communication? Voice. It's voice, right? Voice. Voice signal or communication. You're all right, yeah. It's communication using a voice signal. What's CW? <laughs> Morse code. Continuous wave, right? Or Morse code. Understanding Morse code, lots of dots and bits and uh, that's about it. That's about it, right? And it's a combination of those that uh, we have to try to understand. Luckily, it's not part of the test. Anymore. Anymore. Right. Data. It's digital signal or communication, right? HF. High frequency. High frequency, yep. It's from 3 to 30 megahertz. Okay, that's where that falls. How about VHF? Anybody know where that falls? Howard's going to cheat. He's got the cheat right there. Thirty to three hundred. Thirty to three hundred. That is correct. Yeah. And how about UHF? 300 to 3,000 megahertz. Okay. So, mix. What, what's mix? Something you put in your drink? You multiply two signals. You mix them together. Okay. You've got a couple of signals, you mix them together. That's mix. Product. It's a result of multiplying two signals. So you mix it, multiply two signals, and you get the product. So decibel, this is no G's way. Okay. Penny, Penny, Penny changed that slide. I don't think it said no G's way. I didn't way. change it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't write something just. So this is no G's way. Um, so he's using DB. 
number db 10 log 10 ratio essentially if you double your decibels you're going up three if you half your decibels you're going down three if you ten fold them yeah power okay if you ten fold your power you're going up ten decibels take a tenth of it you're going down ten therefore if you're going to increase 26 decibels, you take 10 times 10 times 2 times 2. So 26 decibels is 400 times more power. So 10 by 10, which is 100, right? Then you times that by 2 by 2, that's 4. So 100 times 4 equals 400. Okay? So if you think about this, tenfold, right? You got ten decibels. So we're going to, we're looking at twenty. So twenty is two of these, right? So ten times ten. Then we've got six, which is double. It's double twice, right? So two times two. And you times the two of these together, you get four hundred. Now, Penny is a, a different way that she does it than well, I think. Well, just the exponents. <laughs> the exponents. Whatever decibel you want, you just move the decimal point over one spot to the left. So five decibels would be 0. 0.5, 10 to the 0. 0.5 power. That is what, I mean, or like 10. Move the decimal point one over, it's just 10. 10 to the first power, 10. Um, eight, that, that's what you hold by. Anyway, All right. yeah, I've talked about it before. <laughs> okay, so now if we're going down 9 decibels, right? So we're going down, and this is a half, so we're going down 3. So we're going down 3 times, right? So a half times a half times a half. That's times the top together, you times 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So that's 4 times 2 is 8. It's 1 eighth as much. So nine, nine decibels down is one eighth as much as you were before. Question. Yes. Where does this apply? How do you need it? Well, there are questions on the test about this. Besides. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are trying to figure out uh, what your power restrictions are, you might use some of this. But you're not going to use a lot of it. To be honest with you, you may need to the test. You'll be able to test. Okay, so decibel summary three decibels is two times, six decibels is four times, nine is eight times, ten is ten times. That one's the easy Yeah, well, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> no, don't take me down that road. Okay, 20 is 100 times, which is two of these, right? Or, or just 10 to the second power. Yeah. It's right. Okay. to the third power is 1,000. All right, 23 decibels, 200 times. 39 is 8,000 times. So you can use Noji's way. So you got 10 here three times, right? 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. And 9 is what? 8? So 8 times 1,000 is 8,000. And then it goes the other way, you know. Minus three is a half, minus six is a quarter, minus nine is an eighth, minus 10 is a tenth, minus 20 is a hundredth, minus 30 is one one thousandth of times, and 23 is one two hundred times. And 39 is one eight thousand times. So it's just the opposite, just the reciprocal of these. Just put one over it as a fraction. So 
that's a decimal summary. Okay, now we get into the fun math stuff, okay? McLaren series for trigonomet trigonomet trigonometric sign. This will be reviewed. <laughs> And this is this review of sign. How many of you guys saw this in uh, college, in high school? Uh, I saw it and I've forgotten all of it. So it's nothing to be memorized or nothing. To, yeah. You don't need to know. You don't need to know this. Okay. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good math. It's good theory. And uh, and it works but don't worry about it. Okay, square wave review. A square wave, wave is actually the infinite sum of a series of odd harmonic sine waves. Now, a sine wave is, you've seen the sine wave, right? Okay. Goes up and down, sine wave itself right here, goes up, down, comes back up to the center line. And here's the formula for these square ones. We'll pass that. Okay. All right. So let's start talking about some uh, some fun stuff. The prior stuff was that was review. Okay. <laughs> and uh, if you have questions about that stuff, Penny will be glad to help walk you through any of that. She's a mathematical genius in my family. I can calculate things with a tank. Okay. So what do we got? We got operating standards that we want to talk about. We've got station restrictions, station control, the amateur satellite service, and the volunteer examiner program. We want to cover some of this stuff here this evening. Okay, how many of you have seen one of these? Okay, everybody? Okay, it's our band plans, right? I keep one of these right by my radio. Because you think I can remember when I'm changing bands exactly where I need to be? Not in this noggin, okay? I, I try to remember, I, and if I'm using a certain band, like I use 20 meters a lot, right? 20 meters is probably my favorite band that I use. And I know that I can speak with voice from 14150 to 14350. I know within there, I'm okay. Okay? But if I go up to 80 meters, I know it's three point something. But what it is, I often will refer to this, okay? Now for the test, yeah, we need to memorize some of the bands and what the, the sides of them are and uh, where we can operate. But when we're actually operating, there's nothing to say you can't have a help right by your radio to help you. I mean, we have these out here by our radios out here in the clubhouse, right? Because we want to operate where we have privileges. And we don't want to get outside the privileges. I was uh, reading a news article this morning, or this afternoon, something. And I had seen it before. But there was a ham just recently got fined $24,000 for operating outside of a band plan. Okay, now there was one last year, hit the news heavily, I think he was fined like 150000 because he was interfering with the firefighters out in Idaho or Washington. And he was trying to help because he, he was, I've been there, I know that terrain. I'm going to tell these guys what I know. Well, it was interfering with the firefighters' communication. And so they tracked him down, and he got fined $150,000. Now, the one that got fined the $24,000, he was a amateur extra. He has his extra license. It was a net. There was a net going on. And he did, apparently he didn't like the net. So what did he do? Heat up his radio, turned on some music, sent full power, and blasting out the net. 
Well, they tracked him down. And uh, he wasn't given his call sign, but they were able to track him and uh, probably doing some fox hunting to, to find out where his signal is coming from. And uh, he ultimately was fined $24,000. He has a right to appeal. Uh, but uh, I, don't know, I don't know that he'll win it. I'm surprised it was that low. Yeah, I was too, to be I honest with you. I saw that, and I believe what the, what the actual fine was for not giving his calls. I don't know if they're getting to the music part, which you really can't do either, but he was not giving his call sign. He was not, he was not identifying what it was transmitting. Yeah. So. He was also deliberately interfering with And he was delivering interference with, with amateur radio. Yeah, yeah the music thing, I mean, if it's incidental to the communication, that's fine. Yes, if it's incidental. Well, that was not incidental, that was intentional. That was intentional. Yeah, he was intentionally trying to disrupt the net. So, so you know, speaking of within bands, when you say four, you know, up to 14350, you mean up to 14350 minus 3 kilohertz? Minus 3 kilohertz, you're absolutely right. Yes, good point. And we will talk about that. So, but that, you are absolutely right. So, no, I can't turn my radio to 14350 because I will operate out of, out of band. And how many of us have done that? We've swung the dial and, the, oh crap, let's get back in here. But I, I always like to double check before I hit that PTT to make sure where I am set on the radio. I do that, I, I've done that one flip between 20 and 40, this upper versus lower side band. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, shoot, I'm on the upper side band. Right, exactly, exactly. So what's on the other side of that? You go past your band. It, it's another frequency that is allocated somewhere else that no. we do not have privileges in. Oh. All right. So amplitude modulation is what we have pictured here, okay? So modulating signal, audio, superimposed on a carrier signal. So this results in a modulated signal. So we've got an audio signal input, and uh, okay, this. okay, this is time. This is time. It's just not very clear. Okay, that's what that says. So we've got a signal that's coming along here over time. And then we got audio frequency, right? Here's the audio frequency, which is up here, in here. And this is the RF frequency inside here. And then when we modulate it, the audio frequency loses here. There's, there's a better picture of this when we get down to a couple more slides. But the, res the results, once you superimpose a modulating audio signal on a carrier signal, this is what you end up with. So amplitude modulation calculation, don't memorize or try this at home, okay? Starts with a carrier frequency. Now you're going to see why I say don't try this at home. Okay, it's two pi frequency uh, carrier uh, time. This is carrier superimposed on time equals amplitude. So, and your modulating signal, your voice, which is this modulating signal times the cosine, and the force mt to be positive by assuming m is between 0 and 1 and by adding 1 bytes, because we can't have negative sound. So it's got to be positive, it's got to be superimposed, it's got to be a 
positive number because we can't go negative with sound. But don't worry, this is for education only. It's not on a test. So if we vary the amplitude with the voice signal by mixing, which is multiplying, right? We get all kinds of formulas. Oh boy, and it really gets fun. And uh, the resulting product is a carrier plus two side bands. Now this is the important part right here. The result of all of this is the carrier plus two side bands. Can I point something? You can. <laughs> oh, just like, do you know how many two pies there are? And do you remember what the formula is for a circle? Two pi r. Two pi times the radius is. Yeah, yeah. Is well, anyway. Circle. Yeah. Yes, radius r. So these, radius. so these represent so, circles. Yes, right. So it, the idea is, <laughs> it's all signals circular. You know, the, I mean, it's going around the. Okay. Circle. Yeah. I'm not trying to understand any of this. I've worked with trigonometry a lot. Great triangle. Yep. Sine or cosine is usually associated with an angle. Yes, and we will get into that. So yes. that's a sine. What number is the sine? It's a sine times two pi of C T. What so number is sine? So is that? So two pi frequency carrier, frequency of the carrier times time. That's your sine. Well, there is an angle. We get into angles later on. Yeah. Which is part of it. So, Rick, there's a test on this for all extras. <laughs> I'm the one that wrote that. <laughs> Man, that explains a lot. <laughs> well, all right. Eventually, we do talk about they talk about phase angles and all. I mean, it's like in the book, but when we're talking about yeah, yeah. But for this part, yeah. we want to talk to, to realize that the result is the carrier plus two side bands. But those those are uh, yeah upper and lower. Okay, now you know what makes up AM and its side bands. There are two side bands on AM too. Okay, there's an upper and a lower. Now, let's put it in English, okay? <laughs> AM bandwidth occupied by all three, the carrier and its two side bands. Okay, so here's the carrier, right? And we got a side band here, and we got a side band here. So now, if we're doing single side band, you remove the carrier and one side band. So, so it looks like this. So if you, so here's the full AM modulation it has the carrier and both side bands. This side band and this side band. Now we remove the carrier and we remove one of the side bands. So we take out the carrier and we remove this side band. We're left with upper side band. Okay? All we have is the upper side band. Now if we do the opposite, we take get rid of the carrier and we get rid of this upper side band, we're left with single side band modulation, which is the lower side band. So when we're talking about upper side band and lower side band, we're talking about getting rid of the carrier and one of the side bands. And three kilohertz maximum for each side band, just as uh, Aaron was talking about when you get close to the edge of the band. Okay? And we'll talk about how you can tell which one you have, where you have to be from that edge uh, shortly. Okay, so the single side band phone agreement. Lower side band is used on 160, 75, 80, and 40 meters. 
Okay, that's convention. That's basically the agreement that is convention on what we would use. We will use lower sideband on 160, 75, 80, and 40. And we'll use upper sideband on 60, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. Okay? Now, funny story. This is me. Okay. I got my extra. I studied all this. I knew all this. I got my radio. And I'm listening to 40 meters. Okay? And all it sounds like is garble. I know somebody's there. I can't understand a word they're saying. <laughs> I'm going, what in the world? My radio must be broken. And they just send it back and get my radio fixed. Then I'm looking through my notes. I'm on 40 meters. And I realized that my radio is set to upper sideband. That's why I was here. I clicked it over to uh, lower sideband, and I'm hearing perfectly good Spanish. Somebody was broadcasting in Spanish, but I knew it was Spanish. And then I switched the frequency, and I got somebody in English. So I. <laughs> okay, I, I just wanted to point out that you can kind of think of 30 meters as being like a borderline. I mean, you can't do up, you can't do single sideband on 30 meters. But, you know, the numbers that are bigger than 30 are usually lower sideband than the numbers that are smaller. So it's giving a yep, with the <laughs> exception of 60. With, with 60, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just going to point that out. 60 is the exception, but everything else, you know, for the sm smaller meters, it's upper side down, bigger, if it's bigger than 40, it's lower side, except for 60. Okay. So it yeah. just makes it easier That's to know channel one. Yeah, it's easier to remember. Them to remember. Channels. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions on this? Okay. Why? Why? That's the, always the, the, the proverbial question. Why? Why is this the case? Well, it's current amateur practice. Okay. Could we do upper side band on 40 meters? Sure. Could. Yeah. So if, if Aaron's on 40 meters and I'm on 40 meters, all of a sudden we decide we want to talk on upper side band, could we do it? Sure. We switch our radios to upper side band and we can talk and we can communicate. It would work. Just sit an extra twenty-four thousand dollars aside for <laughs> if you're out of band. <laughs> you're out of band. Okay. So band edge quiz number one. You hear the voice station calling CQ on seven point one two seven megahertz. Is it legal to key up your mic and answer it? Seven point one two seven. Any ideas? I'm gonna guess that's the edge of the band, and if you key up on that frequency, you'll your bandwidth will take you outside the edge. Yes. Okay. So yes. which 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 band is this? Seven point one two seven. Give me the sheet. You're cheating too. It's <laughs> forty meters. Forty meters. Yeah, forty. You get the little one. Oh, you can get it out. 40 meters. What's the edge of 40? 125. 125. 125. Yes, 125. So 127 is just inside the band, but not by enough. Nope. Lower side band will extend three kilohertz down. One kilohertz below the edge of the band. Okay. So we're on 40 meters, right? 
7.125, and we're going to drop, if we were at 127, we drop 3, that'll take us down to 7.124, right? And if our edge is at 7.125, we're out of band. Okay. Could this station be calling legally? What do you think? You might depend on where they're located. So you're hearing it on 7.127. That's where you're hearing it. I mean, they, they could be actually up on 7.13 and, uh, and still be hitting 127. Because you're going to have a little bit of bandwidth, right? When you, when you, when you transmit. So if they were transmitting on 7.127, their signal very much well could be going out of that, and then they would not be able to. OK. So CW spectrum, it's a little bit different. It's a very narrow bandwidth, OK? It's 150 hertz. But it extends to both sides of the carrier. So carrier's right here in the center, right? So it's at this frequency, which is uh, <coughs> not totally sure what frequency that is, but looks like about 700 for the carrier. And it extends to 150 bandwidth. So it's uh, 150. So it's very narrow and extends on both sides of the carrier. So let's take a look at this, see if we can figure that out a little closer. The CPW station is calling CQ on 7.0 megahertz. Is it legal to answer it? Okay, so we're at 7.0, right? That's right on the edge. So. It's going to extend 75 hertz below the band edge. And why 75, not 150? Because back here we saw that it's 150 wide, right? Well, it's got 75 on this side and 75 on this side of the carrier. It's equal to 150. So, CW will extend below the band edge by 75 hertz. So, can't do it. Don't do it. Don't want to get in trouble. I always like to stay as far away from the band edge as I can, just so I make sure I'm operating legal. Okay, well, the 60 meter band, how is it different? How is it unique? Channels. Channels, right. It's got channels instead of the normal frequency, right? There's a couple other things that go along with it. It's limited to 100 watts uh, PEP. What's PEP? Peak envelope power. Peak envelope power, yeah. So it's limited to 100 watts peak envelope power. It's got channelized frequencies and data has a 2.8 kilohertz bandwidth. <laughs> and CW must be set to the center frequency. Okay? It must be at the center frequency. And also note, this is not on the exam, but it uses upper side band. That's noted right here, then. So if you look at your band plans, um, I should have had it. Anybody not have a band plan? Okay, I'll, well, I'll make sure I bring some next week. I've, I've got a folder up, but I did not grab that folder. There used to be a whole stack of them here somewhere. Yeah, it's, a, it's in my office right now. Yeah. So I'll, I'll make sure I bring some next week too. 
But anyway, uh, it's, uh, on the band plan, it shows the center frequency is 60 meters. It's, all, it's also in the uh, extra book. Yes, it is uh, in the extra two dash two. Two dash two. You got your extra. All right. Now, what are some antenna restrictions that we have to worry about? Location, important to American history, act, architecture, or culture. Okay, so there's going to be restrictions around that. So if we're out, uh, let's say we're out in, uh, I've got a buddy, he's, uh, that I work with, he's going to Boston this weekend. And uh, American history sites. He's going to have restrictions on where you can put antennas around that American history site. Okay? Cultural centers. There's going to be some restrictions. Or there could be some restrictions around there. And different types of architecture. Environmental assessment is required before placing one in an officially designated wilderness or wildlife area. So if you're placing an antenna, In an officially designated wilderness area or wildlife area, you've got to have an assessment done. Permanent or temporary? It's a good question. What do you think? What was the question? Is it permanent antenna installation or temporary? Probably temporary. Yeah, it's. Uh, You would want to check with them, okay? Because POTUS, they're in wilderness areas and in uh, wildlife areas, wildlife management areas. But you would not, you know, if you're close to one of those, and why do you think that would be? All of a sudden, you're putting up an antenna. Let's say you have property next to a wildlife area, right? And you want to put up an antenna. Lightning? Yep. Fall zone. Fall zone. Fall zone? Yep. How about migratory birds? Or impacting them in some way? Or, or other types of wildlife? You're going to be running a lot of power to, to do that, but. And you don't want to be cooking an endangered bird with two kilowatts on your doggy. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you've got an eagle that lands up on your antenna and you click up uh, 1,500 watts. Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> I see that as a signature on the ham radio forum. Once it says, if you ain't cooking birds, you ain't pushing up power. <laughs> okay. So you don't, you don't want to be doing that, right? So, you know, you, FCC requires an environmental assessment. Okay. FAA must obtain FAA approval. Uh, for Part 17 rules before placing one near an airport. If it goes above uh, 200 feet right now, you have to have FAA approval if you're near an airport. You don't want, you don't want airplanes running into your antenna. Didn't they change that? Then they lowered it. It's even shorter than that now. I thought. Uh, it used to be, I think, 300, and they lowered it to 200. Yeah, I think it's 200 anywhere near an airport. It's it could be. Yeah. Maybe that's what it could be. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. So anything, anything at 200 feet or above has to be lit also. I think right. Yep. Oh, wait, they want me to put up. I had a 50 footer and want you to paint it and light it. Really? It's two miles from the airport. I go, the trees are tall. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Some people light like the trees. Yeah, put your Christmas lights up on them all year long. All right. Now another area. That another, that another question, comment. Spurious emissions. So what is spurious emission? Anybody have an idea? Now things. Now things. <laughs> Before they were part <laughs> Yeah. Okay, 
Signal outside its bandwidth that can be reduced without losing its intended information. Okay? So if you've got a signal that's going outside of the bandwidth and you have the ability to reduce that, it's a spurious emission. If it interferes with broadcast, yeah, you, you may have to limit your hours of operation. Okay? So if you've got spurious uh, emissions and all of a sudden you're interfering with a broadcast station that's on the other side of your band privileges, you may have to limit your uh, hours of operation. If they operate 8 to 5, you may not be able to operate 8 to 5. You may have to deal with your maximum emissions. Spurious emissions allowed up to minus 43 decibels. And you have to have a permit for the emission. You can obtain a permit to experiment with spurious emissions and interference. So you can get a permit if you're going to, for experimental purposes, but don't be doing it without that permit, okay? You're going to want to get a permit to experiment. Okay, maritime and air ham radio. All amateur operations must be approved by the skipper or pilot in charge. So, here in uh, August, Penny and I are going on a cruise. And I'm thinking, man, this would be a great opportunity. I'm going up to Alaska, it would be a great opportunity to take my radio. Make contacts out of Alaska. What a great opportunity that would be. Guess what I can't take on that cruise ship? A radio. What? Because the skipper's telling me I can't take it. That's why. The whole line is saying you can't take it. And why couldn't you take it? What would be a problem with that? You're interfering with their communications. Yeah. They're, they're strictly radio communications, right? Off of that ship. You don't want to interfere with their communications. They could run into problems too if you're operating in if you're in Canadian, like Canadian waters. Exactly. And your plan's different. The next thing you know, you got the Canadian equivalent of the FCC coming up to the ship. Yep. Guess guess where my radio stand? Right here. <laughs> right here in the shack. Okay. So anyway, if you're if you're out there and you're say you're on a private private boat, right? You know. You got uh, Bob's the skipper, and he's got Gilligan as his first mate. <laughs> and he's got Marianne on there, and he's got the professor, and the professor's a the, uh, ham radio operator, and the professor wants to take his radio out on Bob's boat. Who does he have to ask? He has to ask Bob. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, U.S. air and sea vessels require FCC ham licenses to operate amateur equipment. So, if they're going to operate on the amateur bands from these ships, these boats, they need to have FCC ham licenses. Well, how about Kyle? Kyle is a pilot. He's up in his airplane. And he wants to take his ham radio up there. Can he? Sure. He can take it. Kyle's a general. Where can he operate? In the general band plan, right? What if Kyle was a tech? Could he operate an HF rig out of his airplane? He's the pilot. 10 meter. 10 meter, yeah. But only 10 meter, right? has to be according to the FCC ham licenses and the rules and regulations that, that go with them. Is that based off of where the craft is registered? Uh, it's like if a plane is registered out of Canada or Europe somewhere. Once you cross in the U.S. space, yeah, once he crosses into U.S. space, it'd be subject to the U.S. regulations. Oh, right, hold up. It, it would be just like you and I 
if, if we went over to uh, the European Union, Union, we've got an FCC license, right? But we would have to make sure that there was an agreement between our countries yeah. in order to operate. And then we would have to operate within the regulations that they have over there. It's just like somebody comes from Germany to operate and they have we have reciprocal agreement. They still have to operate under FCC rules. They can't operate outside of I suppose our kind of be the same if you're in international waters, you know, if you're on a German registered ship. You would you be, have to operate within their, their within their rules. operation because you're essentially on German territory. Even though you're in international waters, you're on a German flag vessel. Great questions. All right, spread spectrum transmissions. These are transmitted, frequency changes rapidly. There's an interference resistant algorithm, and they can only be done on frequencies above 222 megahertz. Okay. So this is another area where there are restrictions, right? Frequency changes rapidly, interference resistant algorithm, and above 222 megahertz. And they create no harmful interference. Yes, Penny. Oh, I was just gonna say that's one and a quarter meters. <laughs> yeah, one and a quarter meters. and only use in an FCC controlled area, USA. And of course, no obscuring of messages. And this is, this is it with anything. We cannot send any message that's obscure. Basically, we can't send code. You know, I wanna send a message to, uh, to Aaron, and I don't want anybody else to know what we're talking about. I don't want Brian to know what I'm sending a message to, to Aaron. Can I do that? Can I put a code in there so I can only Aaron can decode that and know what I'm saying? No. Okay. So Brian can listen in. Okay. So that's that's one of the things we can't obscure our messages with with codes. And the maximum power on spread spectrum transmissions is 10 watts. And can be used for 2.4 gigahertz mesh networks. All right, controlling our station. That's another important factor and this falls under the FCC controls and guidelines. Local control, what would make up local control? How about this radio out here? In the hand shack. What would mean this under local control? Somebody that's at the radio. Somebody's at the radio. Yes. Direct manipulation by the control operator. Okay? So, if I'm out there, I'm running the radio, I have control over it, I've got local control over that radio. How about remote control? Like a repeater? Yeah. There's some, uh, uh, is it, uh, you don't need to be at the radio. Yeah, you don't have to be at the radio. Uh, I've seen a couple of places do that. I've, heard, I've seen people using uh, their uh, radios interface to their computer, using like any desk to remotely connect to the computer to, to operate the radio, run it, some digital mode or whatever. Yep. I've also seen Kenwood has remote control HF rigs that use 440 as the, as the control frequency. So you can remotely control a HF rig over 440. Ah. It's really good. That, that would be. I've been looking a little bit at that remote control stuff. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of different programs that you can get. There's one uh, remote, remote 
RX, or Remote TX, I can't remember which one it is, that uh, goes over the internet and you use a uh, Raspberry Pi to, to connect. And you can control your radio from wherever you have an internet. So there's a lot of that out there. So remote control is basically controlled indirectly through a link. Okay. So a remote control would not be a repeater because you're not really controlling that through a, a link. Okay. And we'll get to what a repeater falls into here in a second. But you know, if if I'm on my tablet or my computer, and I'm sitting on a, a, a ship out in the middle of the ocean, and I got internet, I could potentially control my radio that's sitting in my house in Minnesota and listen in to the, the welfare net. And that's perfectly fine, because that's a remote control operation. Because okay. I'm not broadcasting anything there. It's all remote control. And there's a lot of stations that will do that. Uh, we had a presentation. How many were here when uh, Ray gave the presentation on remote control? So there's some remote stations out there that put their stations out that people can sign up for and, and can actually connect to. They charge you by the minute or whatever, but you can you can do that if, you, if you're so inclined. So. The control operator must be present at the control point. So, if I'm at my computer controlling my radio, I need to be at the control point, which is my computer. That's where I'm controlling my radio from. Okay. I don't have to be at the radio, but I do have to be at the point of where it's being controlled. And you must implement a three minute timeout if the link fails. So if you've got a link that fails, and you're transmitting, you got to have a three minute that will drop it. Okay, drop that transmission. That's, that's got to be part of it if you're going to do remote control. Now, automatic control. This is where the repeater's going to play. Okay, control operator does not need to be at the control point. Okay, we're bouncing a signal off the repeater. The repeater's rebroadcasting, right? It's automatic. So repeaters, auxiliary, and space stations are the types of facilities or equipment that can be automatic control, be controlled. Okay. Now we're talking when we're talking about space stations. Yeah, we got the International Space Station, but what other space stations do we have that they would be talking about? Satellites. Satellites. Any questions on this? What would auxiliary be? What would auxiliary be? Penny, what's an auxiliary? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody know auxiliary? Randy! Yes? We got an extra question for you. That's Rick, he's an extra. Randy! I'm extra special. Yes? Okay, automatic control. Okay. Control operator does not need to be present at the control points. Similar, which is repeaters, auxiliary, and space stations. What is an example of an auxiliary? I have no idea. <laughs> we will find out the answer and we will let you know next week. Yeah, I have no idea. Ricky? You would be on your gateway? by software and uh, fail shut down. Yeah, it could be just like not a general term for the compass. Yeah. We, we can find the answer. It's in the book. I know that. 3-12. According to the index. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I say. We're going to learn together. Try with that one, right? Alright. An auxiliary station is an amateur station other than a message 
forwarding system that is transmitting communications point to point within a system of cooperating amateur stations. Do you want to put that in English? I have no idea what it means. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, not a message forwarding system. So it's transmitting communications point to point within a system. Yeah, it, it sounds a lot like peer to peer. Yep. Looking like Arden. What's that? Arden maybe? Yeah. Could be. Yeah. That could be another example. That, yeah. That, that could be a very, very good example. Yep. Oh, right. <laughs> no, no, no. That's a, that's a message. That's a message. Yes, yes. Sorry, it would be like peer to peer. Yeah. Okay. More to come on that. More to come. I'll, I'll, I'll do some research on that this week. Okay. Now, HF repeaters are limited to 29.5 to 29.7 megahertz. Okay. So, what band is that in? 10 meter. 10 meter? 10 meter. Okay. So there are some repeaters on HF, but they are limited to that. And I, I have heard some of those out there. There's one over in, that I'm aware of over in, I think it's Rochester, New York, um, that I've heard before. There's some other ones. If you Google it, you can, you can find the frequencies that we got out there. Okay, so how about outside regular communication? Business. There's restrictions on business communications. So you must not transmit for pecuniary reasons. And what does this word mean? Pecuniary. Pecuniary. Making money. Making money. Yep, you can't transmit to make money. Okay. No transmissions for hire. Okay? I transmit. Bob, I need a job. You gonna hire me? Or Brian, I got a job for you. I wanna hire you. Nah. Or I need a taxi cab. <laughs> so I call a taxi cab on the on the amateur radio. And he's out there for hire, right? It doesn't work, right? So we can't do that. Okay, telemetry. One way transmission of measurements. That's what telemetry is, okay? One way transmission of measurements. And that's fine, that, that works, you can do that. But that's what it has to be limited to. Okay. How about borders? Line A, anybody heard of line A? Line A is not too far from us. It's just, just up the road, a ways, right? It's parallel to and just south of the Canadian border. Randy, you remember Ray talking about that remote control station he uses? Yep. He controls. That's an auxiliary station. It's a close contact between one port and another. Okay. So that's a good example of that remote control station. So I can run it from my, my phone up here and run yep. my auxiliary. There you go. So would that be like, here's a repeater, here's a repeater, and you're using like 400 megahertz to connect the two? Possibly, yeah. I can, I can, I can see that how that follows into that category. They also said that the auxiliary stations have to be on 225 and above. So you won't get it on VHF. You're not going to get it on VHF. VHF and above. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you, Randy. Okay, so line A is parallel to and just south of the Canadian border. No transmitting on 420 to 430 megahertz north of it. Okay, you go north of that line, you cannot transmit in this frequency range, okay? Except this allows U.S. amateurs to operate in Europe. And I 
can't remember what CEP stands for, but it's an agreement between countries. Okay, National Radio Quiet Zone. There is such a place as a National Radio Quiet Zone where you cannot transmit. And this is the area surrounding the National Radio Astronomy Observ Observatory between Virginia and West Virginia. <clears throat> so if you're driving through that area and you're by that place, don't be up your radio. So that's why they pulled me over. <laughs> Rick, that's not why they really pulled me over. <laughs> okay. So other rules. Races. So any licensee can be certified to operate in races. They can use any amateur frequency. Auxiliary station. Here we go. A technician and hire can control an auxiliary station. RF amplifiers can resell for below 2,000 and used. Must satisfy spurious emission standards at full power. So you can resell if it's below two meters. Okay, Earth and space stations. An Earth station. What would be an Earth station? It's up there. Earth station. It's on the Earth. And within 50 kilometers of the Earth's surface, classifies as an Earth station. And the amateur can operate one. Now, a space station must be able to terminate telecommands. It's on the HF bands or two meters. Okay, VHF two meters. That's where they can operate. And any amateur can operate. So we were up at uh, Camp Ripley on Saturday with the scouts. And uh, Jonathan was up there with his uh, little handheld purple antenna and his two meter radio. And he was getting signals from satellites, space station, as they came over. And he's able to track those. Now, if Jonathan, which is not the case, but if Jonathan was only a technician, could he do that? He could. Okay. As long as he's operating within his band of privileges. Satellite communication, and satellite service, amateur radio stations on satellites. So, amateur radio, there are amateur radio stations that get put into space on satellites, okay? They give out beacons, they are able to, you're able to send your signal to that, that satellite and it'll bounce down, and anybody that can hear that can communicate back to you. Telecommand station controls the space station, okay? So you got the space, you got the space station out there, or satellite, it needs to be able to respond to those telecommands from something that is transmitted here uh, from the air. Okay? And that's how they get controlled. Now the International Space Station is a little different. Any appropriate station designated by the space station's licensee and have stored and forward capability. So this stores digital messages for later <coughs> downloads and relays messages around the world. So if I send a message up to a satellite that has stored forward capabilities, gets the message, it stores it. It cruises around the Earth and it gets above China, or somewhere, Russia, somewhere over there, Ukraine. And the 
it's over Ukraine, and somebody connects, they can download that message. Okay, that's that, what that storm floor is. So satellite frequencies, most mode designator, the uplink and the downlink frequency bands are different. Okay, you have one that's an uplink where you're sending, they got a different downlink. So you're listening on one and hearing, or sending on one and listening on the other. So receiving in UHF from 435 to 438. So one of bands are 23 and 13 centimeter bands. And you can get a linear transponder Linear because the frequency offsets are constant. Okay? So if you got a linear transponder on a satellite, the offsets are constant. And all signal types can be relayed on these. And you have to limit your ERP to avoid the downlink, reducing the downlink power to others. So this is a question on the test. These that are uh, in bold will be questions on the test. So you want to limit your ERP to avoid reducing the downlink power to others. And all signal types can be relayed. Now if you have a satellite in orbit, if it's in an ascending orbit, it's passing from south to north. So when you think of this, you've got ascending. You think of the south pole, okay? And it's going up to the north pole. That's ascending, okay? So it's passing from south to north. Now if it's descending, it's in a descending orbit, it's passing from north to south. So if it's up to the north pole, it's ascending as it's going from the south pole to the north pole, then it goes into a descending orbit as it's going from the north pole to the south. Now the orbital period is the time it takes to make one revolution around the Earth. Okay. That's the orbital period. So, what, what more about satellites? Rapidly repeating fading effect. You're listening to a satellite signal. If you can have it, you can hear fading. All of a sudden that signal is fading away. That's because your satellite's spinning. So if you've got a spinning satellite, the transmission is moving away from it and it's coming back, it's moving away from it, it's coming back, it's moving away. So it's quickly, rapidly repeating with that fading, okay? It's coming back, it's going away as that satellite spins. So you want your antenna to minimize the spinning effects. So in a lot of that, you uh, want a circularly polarized antenna so that it can uh, to take that spinning into uh, that. What do you think a geostationary satellite would be? It stays in one spot. Or it appears to, anyway. It's pretty close to it. Okay, so it appears to stay in one position. So as the Earth is turning, the satellite is kind of hanging right out. They're right above that same spot on the Earth, so it appears to stay in one spot. Now, how do you locate a satellite? You calculate using its Keplerian elements. Okay. And that's what we know about satellites. Okay. Quick, there's more in the book. There's more in him study on satellites and some of this other stuff that we've talked about tonight. Okay, we're, we're hitting some of the high ones. As we get into some of the deeper stuff, we'll go a little bit deeper. So the ham radio examination's minimum, minimum passing score is 37 out of 50, or 74 percent. There needs to be three VEs to administer it, and uh, they all have to be extras. Okay. So the three Bs must certify each passing score, and if an examining 
examinee fails, the application is returned to the examining by the VE. And the VEC can choose to administer an exam by real-time internet vi video, and neither one of our VECs do that. We use Laurel and we use ARRL. They're both in person. Okay, so the volunteer examiner supervise proper conduct during the exam. So th this, uh, Brian, is, is where your uh, tattoos come into play to make sure that they're covered if they've got the answers to the, <laughs> the exam on them. Submits the, exa the application to the BEC following the exam. And not allowed to be a VE for a relative. So when Penny was taking her three tests, I could not be on the VE team. Okay? She can't do it for relatives. She can't do it for brothers, sisters, grandparents, grandchildren, children, uncles, aunts, all that stuff. Okay, okay terminates the exam if the instructions are not being followed. So if... Uh, those taking the test refuse to follow the instructions, the test can be terminated immediately. And penalty for fraud by the VE is revocation of the VE's license. So don't try to bribe the VE because if they budge your score, they can lose their license. Okay? They would not accept that bribe anyway, even if it's donuts. <laughs> right, Rick? Okay. The volunteer examiner coordinator is an organization. I'm taking a test, okay? Okay. I want to pass my extra. 50 bucks. And I'm. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be five. Too much for a donut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the box of credits. Red ones? We're good. Okay, so what would happen if Rick said 50 bucks, bro, and I gave him 50 bucks and he passed me? What would happen to Rick? I'd get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> without, without your license, they, right? Yeah, they'd be coming after me, yeah. Okay. Right answer, thank you. I knew he would come up with something. Okay, so the volunteer examiner coordinator, it's an organization, not a, not a person. So it's the ARRL, right? Or it's the LARL uh, Amateur Radio Club. There's a lot of them. There are a lot of them, okay? But it is the organization, it's not the person. Okay? So the VEC confirms the accreditation of each VE. So in order to become a VE for ARRL, you have to take a test, which is an open book test, and uh, you can become that VE for the ARRL. There is a book that you need to read, 85 pages for the Laurel, and uh, if you pass the ARRL, you just have to read it and ascertain to Chad that you've done so, and you can be accredited there. Okay, these VECs help maintain the pool of license examination questions. <clears throat> and and I think that's just where we're going to stop this evening. How much is that? We'll pick up on this starting next week, operating procedures. And uh, first night, I wasn't exactly sure how long these slides are going to go. I'll try to break them out. Though. It was a little bit. It was a little bit. But we'll, these slides are good. I, I like what he's put together, and I think that uh, we'll have some fun. So bring your questions. You've had some great questions tonight, so keep them coming. I like the interaction. So, so next week we will continue on. Um, and uh, 
we'll get into section element. We're going to go through element two, the operating procedures. And then we'll get into element three, probably, radio wave propagation. But that's why I say we'll have 12 weeks to get through this. But thank you. Any questions that I can answer? And no, my wife did not do this. For the record, she did not do that. Jeff, you done? He's done. Yep, we're done for tonight.